what we would do is we will visit some of the locations, some locations we've been to in previous trips, but to get a visual idea and quite a bit of film in this talk. So let's get started. Okay, so here we have Jerusalem. Now, the, and this is the route from Jerusalem to Jericho. The beginning of the Jericho route is a mistake because I did not do this map, so I'm, I'm not guilty. Actually, the route would have gone this way. We'll be doing that in our next talk. But as you go down from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives, down to Beth Page first, then Bethany, and the route that the person Again, we don't know, was he Jewish, not Jewish, what his position was. The, Luke tells us nothing, but it would have taken us down. We're going to follow this route until two locations that are traditionally the location of where the inn of the, of the, of the Good Samaritan, where the Good Samaritan was put up, and we'll also understand why that's a mistaken location. And you can see here, we can see the beautiful Judean hills, which is also a desert. We'll talk about that. Heading up the Jordan River, all the way up to Capernaum over here. Nazareth over here, just to get an idea. And of course, the Mediterranean Sea. So let's get started. And we'll start with the film, as promised. Now, just an idea. We are now in Jericho. You can see Jericho is here. The Dead Sea is here. <coughs> we are around 25 100 meters below sea level, the Dead Sea at its lowest play point is around 400 meters below sea level. We'll be heading up to Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives is around 850, 870 meters above sea level. This is Jericho of today. This is more where the historical Jericho was, and this was the actual route. You can see Wadi Kelt, which we'll be visiting next week, which is a beautiful, beautiful area we'll be talking about Elisha being there, the two she bears that were located here, we'll talk about them also. Here is the Jordan River, and this is where the baptism took place. Again, we'll be talking about that next week. You can see how the, how the Jordan River meanders, and this is the location. There's a place called Qasr al-Yahud we'll visit in our next talk, and also where the baptism took, where traditionally the children of Israel crossed into the land, and where Elisha received the prophecy from Elijah. So let's get a, an idea of climbing up from Jericho to Jerusalem. And up we go. You can see here is a Herodian palace that was built by King Herod. He had two palaces here, another palace over in this location. We head up to Wadi Kelt, the ascent of Adumim. We'll talk about that later on. Nachal Og, named after Og, the king of Bashan, even though this is not where Bashan is located. You can see Geva, you can see a few of the locations and up to Jerusalem with Bethlehem being over here. This is around seven kilometers to get an idea. So we're heading up to Jerusalem and this is what we would have ascended from Jericho of today, the ascent of Adumim, a fortress we will visit today, down into Nachal Og. It's a beautiful, beautiful walk to take in the middle of the canyon and the valley up to the Roman road ascent. Now, the Roman road was built during the Jewish revolt. So we're talking about the year 70. So it was built on a pre-existing path, but it did not exist in the time of Jesus, which is important to keep in mind. The shoulder up to the Mount of Olives, Kidron Valley, and over to the Temple Mount. Kidron Valley, of course, is the Valley of Judgment. That's why its other name is the Valley of Yehoshaphat, Yeho is God, Shaphat will judge. <coughs> and the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim tradition all see the end of days taking place in that valley. So with that, we will move onwards. So what do we encounter on the road to Jericho? Here's a wonderful picture from around just over 100 years ago in Bethpage. The only problem is all you see is a church here. Because there really was, here we have the Russian Church of Ascension on the top above, but there's really, you see, almost nothing. So the two places we will encounter on our way down is one, Beth Page, or in Hebrew known as Beit Pagi. Pagi in Hebrew are young, unripe dates. Figs, sorry, unripe figs. 
and it's very interesting. <coughs> Again, later on with the story of Beth Page and then Jesus cursing the fig tree, which is interesting. We talked about some previous lecture because it would not have been in full bloom at the time of Passover. And then just a little bit farther to the east, we come across Bethany. And I purposely have Bethany, <laughs> its biblical name, its Arabic name is Alazaria. The Hebrew name is Beit Anya. And the Arabic, of course, in Arabic is Alazaria. And why is that important? Because how do we identify locations? It's a question that we should all ask ourselves. How do we know this is Bethany? And there are three basic ways that archaeologists will identify sites. One is that they actually find uh, carving on a stone. They find maybe a, a, a shred of parchment that actually mentions the name. And that has happened in many places. Those of you who've been up north in Tel Dan, they found a Greek inscription that said to the god of Dan. They found in Gezer, one of the three cities that, three major cities, King Solomon was said to have built, and they found is that the limit of Gezer, in other words, how far you can go on the Sabbath, similar to a, what Luke tells us about the Mount of Olives versus, versus Jerusalem. The second way we know it is the preservation of the name. Either the actual name is preserved or something connected to the name is preserved. And in this case, we actually have a preservation of a name. El Azaria, Lazarus's Hebrew name was El Azar. El Azaria, El Azar, his name was preserved. And so we most likely have the right location, even though there have been cases where mistakes have been made. And then the third way is the connection between the biblical description, which frequently is quite clear, that gives us an exact point. So let's start with Beth Page. Here it is today. We're looking down into the Judean desert. So we're looking to the east, the valley going down here, which would have been the road we would Jesus would have followed to get to, to get down, or Jesus would have followed, or in our case, the man who's about to be robbed. This is the beautiful church because again, Palm Sunday is launched over here. This is the Catholic Church, is also a beautiful Orthodox Church. And it's worth highly recommended. Here you can see this is the Catholic. You can see the rather the Vatican flag getting ready for Palm Sunday. Ah, what a surprise. They have palms in their hands, getting ready to go down. This is what the entrance of the church looks like. Truly beautiful area. And the most interesting thing that's here is this very interesting stone, which is in the church, which the tradition says, this is the stone Jesus climbed on to get onto the donkey slash horse. So here we have the, well, where you, where there's much more to see in, in Beth Page, but we'll leave that at that. Here we have Bethany, beautiful picture from 130 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Postcard, of the same thing, just painted. So we see the Bethany, the general view again, once again, looking into the desert, looking to the east. Here we have Roberts, the great British artist, who in the 19th century painted areas. You see the route to Jerusalem. You see the city of Jerusalem. You see there's nothing here. A few churches. And that's more or less what Jerusalem looked like middle of the 19th century. Looking from here, the gorges are a little exaggerated, but that's artistic freedom. Here we can see the road leading, again, same road that would have been used. This is the remnant of the Roman road, which would have taken Jesus up to Jerusalem, would have taken our friend from the Old Samaria, from the Good Samaritan story down. In Bethany, of course, we come across the tomb of Lazarus, which is a Jewish tomb, more or less from the period of, <coughs> of Jesus. It's a very, very deep tomb. There are explanations why it is so deep. I was always told that maybe Lazarus was a lawyer because there's a tradition to bury lawyers very deep in the ground because deep down they're really good. So, but no, sorry if, if, sorry if anybody's a lawyer, but no. So here you can see the steps leading down. 
this is the room that you could sit in, that you would not be come impure. And then in here is the actual burial cave where people would be buried for a year. So here we have the, and here you can look in from here. It was really an area to enable the gases to escape. People would be buried for a period of a year until the body decomposed and then the stones would be collected and reburied. Here's a beautiful, beautiful film that was done by the Israeli Ministry of Tourism. That's why we can use it. And you can see the zoom again. We can see Temple Mount over here. We're up more or less in the area of Azaria. You can see the towers of Jerusalem behind, the old city from here, starting here, going all the way over to here. And just a, a beautiful, beautiful visual to give us an idea of what you see if you're a bird entering Jerusalem. Again, of course, all of these major beautiful buildings are owned by the churches. Here you can see the masses of people heading down on Palm Sunday to Jerusalem. Here you can see the old city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, the al Mosque, the Valley of Kidron, the Mount of Olives. Over here, Mount Scopus, over here. Is that just a, a site of the really Jerusalem being a truly beautiful city. We said that one of the next places Jesus would have reached was Ma'ale Adumim. Now, Adom in Hebrew is red. You can see the stone is very red here. Very high iron content. It's also <coughs> gone through tectonic activity that has caused the stone to bake. And the first time we come across the term Ma'ale Adumim is in the book of Joshua. They just captured Jericho. They're heading up and they're talking about the different areas, who belongs to what, or what belongs to whom. And it says, and the border went up to Devir from the valley of Achor, and so northward towards Gilgal. There is before the going up to Adumim, which is on the south side of the river, because there's a riverbed in between. There's, again, water only flows there during the winter at times, and the border passes towards water of and Shemesh, Ain, again. Uh, <laughs> I repeat this over and over. The problem with translations, Ain is a spring, a water of source. So Ain Shemesh, the spring of Shemesh, Shemesh's son, and then going there of where at Ain Rogel, again, once again, Ain another spring. So it gives us a very good, so we, again, we know the location by the biblical description. Now, in Hebrew, dam, you can see dalid men, dam is blood, adom is red, and adam is a man. And there's the famous verse, which is a biblical tongue twister, which is shofech dam ha'adam ba'adam damoy shofech, talking about in the book of Genesis, where when we're forbidden from Killing so somebody who kills the blood of a man in a man, his blood shall be spilled. Shofech dam, blood, ha'adam of the man, ba'adam in the man, the mo his blood shall be spilled. So the connection between man and blood makes sense, but also between blood and red also makes sense. That's not the case in Arabic. Just so in Arabic, red is ahma, which is a different word. Now, Eusebius of Caesarea, who was the bishop of Caesarea in the third and fourth century, brilliant historian, brilliant biblical scholar, who also wrote the biography of Constantine, in the Anamastakon, which is a book he published to enable us to identify various locations the biblical location. Those of you who've been to Jordan have seen the map of Madba, which is a must. A lot of that was based on the, well, the Latin translation of the Anamastakon, which was written in Greek. And he says this, Adumim. It's a lot of the tribe of Judah, once a little village, now deserted. The place is called Male Adamim, which again is Male going up, the ascent, Adamim, Miss pronunciation of Adumim, but that was probably the name of at the time, on the road going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. The garrison is there, 
in Greek, the ascent of blood, which is very important. The Latin also calls it the ascent of red or redness for the blood of those who so often poured out by the soldiers. Now, this, so this is calling it the, the tradition of the ascent of blood because there was military presence there. And again, all the way, that's the most famous is the Roman presence, but which is what he, what he would be talking about. <coughs> but throughout the ages, that was an area of major, major bloodshed. It is also on the boundary of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, Benjamin to the north, Judah to the south. A fort of soldiers is located there to help travelers. This is the place of the wounded and bloodied of which the Lord speaks in the parable of the one going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. In other words, it's, he's almost hinting that the name was a prefiguration for what would to come. Only problem is, again, we're talking about a parable, so it didn't actually happen, but the connection. And later on, a more direct link was done. St. Jerome, we're talking about fourth century. We talked about him last week. He translated the Bible into, into Latin. Between Jerusalem and Jericho was a place infested with robbers called in the Hebrew tongue Adomim rather than Adamim i.e. red or bloody because of the blood which was shed there. And St. Jerome hints to even a more of a connection between robbers that were there. And here we have Christanius Crucius <laughs> Adrimochius, who was a 16th century Catholic priest, theologian, and he says, describes Adumim as a place infamous even in later time for robberies and murders, terrible to behold, and so dangerous that no one dared to pass through it without an escort. So what's interesting, and we're not going to, because we're doing less theology today, there are also many Jewish sources, which the story predates the story of the Good Samaritan also talking about the danger of this area because it meanders down and they could be waiting for you around the corner. Even though it was a major route because Jericho and Jerusalem, we talked about last week, were the two major cities of Israel in the time of Jesus. Here we see a remnant of a fortress. This is not the fortress that Eusebius talks about, that, that, that is mentioned in the Anamastakon. This is a crusader fortress, very possibly built in the same location where a Roman fortress was to control the road. The remnants of a Roman fortress have not been found. This was called Castel Rouge. You can guess that there were French Soldiers there, once again, preserving the red name. There's another view of it. Now, interestingly enough, in the middle of the settlement there, there's the largest settlement in the West Bank is called Maledumim. And in the middle, we come across a huge, amazing monastery. The monastery is of St. Eftimius, fourth century also, who built a the fourth, fifth century built a fantastic monastery there on the location he believed was where the Good Samaritan was taken to. And the name of the location was known as Khan. Khan is a hotel in those days, Ahmar in Arabic, red. Now, nowadays you will come across the term Khan al Ahmar in the news from the Middle East because there's a Bedouin a good-sized Bedouin tribe, which Israel is trying to uproot from there. But that's a different topic and a different story. But this is where Khan al Ahmar is. Khan is the inn. Now, I'll ruin the story now already and tell you that in the days of Jesus, inns would be built one day walk from each other. We can see the classical example of that. If any of you ever head down to the far south of Israel, and you have the spice route that the Nabataeans would take, and you'd have those one-day stops where the caravans coming well, all the way from Saudi Arabia, but usually going through Petra, then crossing over to the port of Gaza, and it's a one-day journey. So, before, without ruining the end of our story, the location that the Samaritan would have taken, the injured man would have probably been in Jericho, because it's a one-day trip from Jericho to Jerusalem. But we don't let, as, as we're always taught, we don't let the facts get in the, 
place of, of a good story. So here we say, you can see this amazing monastery, beautiful remnants. We'll see more beautiful mosaics very soon. Here you can see the actual church that was built there. This is a very, the picture unfortunately is shaded, but this was a monk's room that actually a bed was found in. Because the monks in those days, some of them would live in monasteries. Many of them, even within the monasteries, would be hermit monks and they would live alone in their room and not leave. Some would leave on Sunday. We have stories of monks who did not leave for 25 and 30 years. We have monks in Turkey in that period who would sit on the top. So it sounds something like traditions that exist in India till today, sit on the top of a tree for their whole life until they would fall out and die. Now, a little bit farther down, we have the Inn of the Good Samaritan, which was, again, another monastery that was built. And today there's a beautiful, beautiful museum there that has mosaics. So we're going to, we are now driving down. Take a look at the desert. This is a day after, or two days after rain. So there's a little bit of green. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But here we are driving. Take a look at the signs to the right is Ma'ale Adumim, but we're not taking the right turn. We're continuing, you can see the Good Samaritan. And we're heading into, this is the drive that takes us to the Museum of the Good Samaritan. Unfortunately, not many tourists visit here, even though we'll see, we'll get just a taste of some of the phenomenal mosaics that are displayed there. So here we see the Good Samaritan or the Inn of the Good Samaritan. Now, we just took a look at the desert and I'm going to, <laughs> cause we're more or less in the desert now, let's just get some ideas of the desert because it's misunderstood, both its biblical context and its climatic context. Again, I'm quoting from, unfortunately, from the King James Version, and this is what it says in Exodus 3.1, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. In other words, Mount Horeb later on, another name for Mount Sinai. Now, there's a huge problem here. The problem is that if Moses takes the flock, you can't take the flock in the desert. You can take the flock on the edge of the desert, but the word that was translated there, the Hebrew word for midbar, was translated as desert. In Isaiah 35, we read, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Now, translation is totally wrong, <laughs> because the first word used there is midbar, which is the same term that was used in Exodus. The solitary place is the word siyah. Siyah is a term which is hardcore desert. The other term that's sometimes used, that is when they talk about the, well, King David is said to have said in the book of Psalms, there are this, I walked in the Eretz Tziah v'Tzalmavet. Tziah and Tzalmavet, the shadow of death. Yea, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But Eretz Gam Kielech Begei Tzalmavet. I walk in the valley of Tzalmavet. That's another term frequently used for hardcore desert. So the translation is totally wrong. That's why the children of Israel were not in the desert for 40 years. I'm sorry to ruin the story. Because the children of Israel were in the edge of the desert. The term that is used in Hebrew is midbar, which is a term for the edge of the desert. Nowadays, in modern day Hebrew, it's used for desert. But in the biblical times, it's an area where flock can survive. And then we have yesusum midbar v'tziah, that they, this is the verse from Isaiah, yesusum, it shall rejoice midbar v'tziah, v'tagel arava, the word that's used here for desert, is the southern desert of Israel, which is not really which is very far from actually what is usually done. Now, John also, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread 
from heaven to eat. So again, we've got problems with the New Testament text. Also in Acts 8, we're told, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. But sorry, but Gaza is not desert. So the translation is very problematic, both from the Hebrew and from the Greek. Now, the definition of desert, this is, this is more from the, this is closer to the Dead Sea area. Less than 200 millimeters of rain. Some people define that as desert. The more important thing is the evaporation is far greater than the rainfall. In the Judean desert, the evaporation rate is, in parts of it, is 10 and 20 and 100 times greater than the yearly rainfall. That's not the case with Jericho. Now here, you can see the green. And this we just spotted on our way down. Take a look over here. You can see it has rained. The flocks of sheep, very biblical picture, are out there. And again, they start the winter in the deeper desert areas, and then they will, or wilderness areas, and then they will progress closer and closer towards Jerusalem where there's more rainfall, because this area they will devour whatever is left. So back to the end of the Good Samaritan. Let's get some ideas of some of the mosaics. We have here some beautiful, beautiful mosaics. Now take a look. I'll stop this for a minute, because you can see these are flowers, but also crosses. When we find crosses on the floor of a church, that enables us to date it. Because in the year 416, it was forbidden to have crosses on church floors so people won't walk on them. And then again, in the year 627, that was once again passed as law, because some people must not have kept it. So here we see a beautiful, beautiful <clears throat> mosaic coming from around 40 miles to the north of where we're located now. You can see the amazing work that was done. And in this museum, which we'll see a few examples of, what's quite fantastic is you have mosaics from synagogues, churches, and Samaritan synagogues. You can see the stone. The reason the color has survived so fantastically, and we'll see even better color in the near future, which is far better than my photography, is because these are not painted stones. These are all natural stones. So the red would have probably come from where we are now. The black would have come from volcanic stone farther up north. The white stone is located all over. The green is probably down near where Elat is today, where you have the copper field. So the rock would be green. Here we have the remnants of the local oh, church. That's good. So Oops, that's... Well, it was only in the fur. There's... <laughs> I was talking to, I was here once again with my mother and a friend who was visiting the country. Just side comment, if any of you come to Israel, want to have a beautiful place for a service, they, they, this is again, the church is the location of the original church. Some of the mosaics, the, the abscess is the original abscess. And it's just a lovely, lovely location. So you can get an idea of the size of the church that was built here, which in those days was quite spectacular, especially because it was on the road going down to Jericho. Now we're going to enter the museum. I just want, there are a few mosaics here I'd very much like to show you because there's some spectacular, spectacular, don't worry, I didn't crash into the door. We enter the building. The first mosaic we'll see on our right comes from the synagogue in Jericho. Again, later synagogue, probably sixth century. And here you see the menorah. You see the shofar the ram's horn, you see the lulav, it looks like a palm branch because it's what is used on, on the celebration of Sukkot. The menorah, again, once again, has a tripod base, which is the way it was in the temple. And here we have, in Hebrew, written Shalom al Yisrael, peace on Israel. So beautiful mosaic. This is just a side comment. It's not the original. The original is in the Israel Museum. There are two mosaics here, which are not original. All the rest actually are. So you see the remnant of a beautiful, beautiful mosaic. Then we continue. 
and we see a mosaic which came from a synagogue in Gaza. Again, the original of this is also located in the Israel Museum. And you can guess who this is, even if you can't read Hebrew. You say the man playing the harp, the lute, and in Hebrew, da vid. Again, interestingly enough, spelled not the way David's tradition spell, with his taming all the animals, even though usually it was Solomon who was better at taming animals, but you can see a beautiful, beautiful mosaic dating from, once again, probably fifth century, sixth century. Again, fantastic Hebrew. This is Shehuk Dash. It was a remnant that's dedicated, it comes from Samaria, dedicated to. Now, here, the Hebrew is so clear, you can actually read Zachur Latov. It's he, this person is to be remembered for good. Dushat Le. Rabbi Asher HaKodem, maybe Mordechai Asher HaKohen. So it was a priest, somebody who came from the priestly family who donated the building. We see the, and beautiful, this, and then very similar. Now we're entering the church area. <coughs> and here I will tell you the translation of this in just one second. Do they have it here in front of me? Maybe. Because my Greek is not good enough, but I had it before you came. Yes, this says, Lord, accept the offering of those who have offered in this consecrated place. So this is a, again, from the floor of the church that was found in this area. And this was found, this side comment, this was found in Shiloh, Shiloh, where the tabernacle was located. Beautiful pillars carved once again. Beautiful, beautiful work. Interesting, the temple was built, the synagogue the church was built fifth century in Shiloh because it had been abandoned once the Ark of the Covenant left that at the times of Eli the high priest. And from a Jewish perspective, for most of the time, even though also from Shiloh, you can see the remnants of the church in Shiloh, worth visiting anyhow, even if all the mosaics are taken. You can see the remnants of the beautiful, beautiful church in Shiloh. And here you can see fantastic finds from churches. Here you can see the podium where the, these are finds that were found there. You can get, a, these were wine jugs. So you can just see a, a beautiful, beautiful finds that were that, that we have from churches predominantly in Gaza and the West Bank. And here you can see, we'll get back to that in just one second. This is from very close to here. This is from the church, which is called the Martyrium Church, which is, you can see, this is right in front of the altar. We'll see a beautiful red granite stone, which comes from the far southern part of Israel, that with a cross on it that was located there also. So again, Church of the Martyrian Church dedicated to saints who gave their life or who died <coughs> in service of the church. Now, just to side count, we'll talk about that another time. But you see the two deer, those two deer then repeat themselves on top of the Church of All Nations, the Church of Gethsemane, based on a verse from the Book of Psalms. So here we saw the church, and here we already see writing, which is very different. because This is Samaritan. Now, it's very interesting, very important to emphasis. We talked about the Samaritans last week. We'll be talking a little bit about them today. These are from Samaritan synagogues. And many, many Samaritan synagogues have been found throughout the area of Samaria, but also heading into what is known as the areas of Judah, and then down to areas like Beit She'an, Schitopoulos, which is located in the Jordan Valley. Because in the fourth century, there were over a million Samaritans alive. Today, they're around 1,500. We talked last week. Beginning of the 20th century, they were around 150. And these are from Samaritan floors. So we'll 
see, you could, you'll see some interesting carving. It was done into the stones. And here's the most beautiful carving, which again, there's an argument whether it's Byzantine or if it's a little bit later. So the beautiful Samaritan writing carved in, it's in Samaritan, but it's, and it deals with, it starts, I am the Lord, your God, I shall have no God other than me. And then various verses from the Bible, because again, the Samaritans use a similar Bible. What's most interesting here is we see the same thing we would have seen in a Jewish synagogue of that time. We see the menorah, Greek writing in this case, <coughs> the table, you see the probably the showbreads that are on display here. And here you see an ark where the Samaritan Bible would be kept, the Samaritan Bible, similar to the Jewish Bible, but with around 1,500 differences, especially dealing with Jerusalem, as we talked about yesterday. But you can see amazing, amazing remains. And the funny thing is, most likely the same person, the same team that would have made the, the mosaic floors, 5th, 6th, 7th century, in Jewish synagogues, would have also made it in the Samaritan ones. So let's go back to the Good Samaritan because we have, I still owe you a debt from last week to complete the story of the Good Samaritan, and we'll be doing that. So Luke tells us this in chapter 10. And Jesus answering said, after he challenged the lawyer, a certain man went down, remember that, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And again, very important that they emphasize a certain priest because there have been people who said it was a high priest. It was just a certain priest. And we'll talk a bit about who priests were. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who journeyed came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on so what the story isn't, <laughs> because throughout ages, there have been many interpretations. We're going to first deal with some of the things. Now, here's Origen, 4th century, and the homilies of Luke. He tells something that's not his interpretation, but was an accepted interpretation in those days. And it goes like this. One of the elders wanted to interpret the parable as follows. The man who was going down is Adam, Jerusalem is paradise, and Jericho is the world. The robbers are hostile powers. The priest is the law, i.e. the Jews in a way. The Levite is the prophets and the Samaritan is Christ, which is quite amazing because you just read one chapter before and Jesus and the Samaritans did not get along that well. The wounds are disobedience. The beast is the Lord's body. <coughs> the pandicum, that is the stable, which accepts all who wish to enter is the church, and further, the two dinari, the two coins that the Samaritan gave in the inn, which accepts, uh, mean the father and the son. The manager of the stable is the head of the church, to whom its care has been entrusted. And the fact that the Samaritan promises he will return represents the Savior's second coming. Here somebody takes, and we'll see in just a couple of minutes how simple the story is. And here's taking it a little out of context. So first of all, who were the robbers? Now, Sharon Ringe in, in her book, Luke, says the robbers are roving terrorists staging their own form of protest against various types of official and unofficial exploitation of the poor. In other words, what she's saying, she's defending the robbers because in a way they were Jewish Robin Hood. The problem is that it just doesn't work. Lestai, and the citrus is a term that became used both in Hebrew and in Aramaic, are robbers. Where does that appear in the New Testament? In 2 Corinthians, or, or as Donald Trump defined it once, 2 Corinthians, and it says this, in journeying often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. 
So they're not as robbers knuckle. John, who is defined as a lestai? Barabbas. He wasn't, <laughs> he was not a Robin Hood. So clearly not true. Who were the priests and the Levites? In Deuteronomy 18, we're told, verse 1, the priest and the Levites and all the tribe of Levi. In other words, priests and Levites come from the tribe of the Levi. They were appointed. There was a plague sent in the desert. Firstborns were supposed to serve God. Then the Levites, doing what Moses asked from them, took their place, shall have no part nor inheritance within Israel. In other words, they did not own land. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. They'd receive when they work in the temple, and then they also receive part of the tithing that the children of Israel do. Then he shall minister in the name of God, we're talking about the prison, his brethren, the Levites do, and stand before God. In other words, priests would serve in the temple. Not all priests would serve in the temple. Priests would serve in the temple. And here, one of the, the first priests we come across in the book of Luke is a good guy. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah, Zacharias, of the course of Abiah. And that's very important. The course of Abiah, there were 24 groups of priests that would come to work in the temple for a week at a time. And they would be based in various locations. And then it's as if, but then not everybody from the course of a bio would live in a certain location, but there would be a central area, as would be the 24 course. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, in other words, also from a priestly family, and her name was Elizabeth, and Sheva. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. In other words, when the story with, with Zacharias and it takes place in the temple. That was during his week that he was working in the temple. So the, the concept, the priests were the, I've read in many places, priests were the wealthy ones. No, the high priests, the leaders, and those are the ones that Luke attacks towards the end of his book. They were corrupt and they were, <coughs> they were very wealthy and their houses have been found in Jerusalem. But the vast majority of the priests lived a very simple life. So why Jericho and priests? These are priestly tombs found in Jericho from the time of Jesus. Well, we're not going to get to how we know they were priestly tombs, but they were the names that were mentioned here. We know they were tombs. Now, in the Babylonian Talmud, in the Tractate of Ta'anit, we're told, the sages taught there were 24 priestly watches, in the land of Israel, those were courses, and 12 in Jericho. So according to this tradition, Jericho was the center of priests. The Gemara, the Gemara is the Talmud, because the, the internet is explaining the text, because if you don't know how to read it, it's hard to connect between the two. The Gemara expresses surprise at the statement, 12 in Jericho? In that case, there were too many of them, making a total of 36 watches, because we have the location of the 24 watches. Jericho is not one of them. A bit south, a bit north of there, there is one of them in a place called Kochav Hayerden. Rather, the Brita, in other words, second century source, should be read as follows. There were 24 in total, 12 of which were in Jericho. How so? When the time arrived for the members of a certain priestly watch to ascend, half the priestly watch would ascend from all over the land of Israel to Jerusalem and half the priestly watch would ascend from Jericho in order to provide water and food to their brothers in Jerusalem from Jericho. And was, Jericho was the collecting location for all the priests. So for a priest to go down to Jericho would make more than a lot of sense. Now the question is, why didn't the priest and the Levite help? So there have been many explanations. The Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges says this. He was selfishly afraid to risk trouble and ceremonial defilement. And since no one was there to know of his conduct, he was thus led to neglect the traditional kindness of Jews towards their countrymen. In other words, 
and this is an explanation which has been given throughout the ages. Till today, it's the most prominent explanation. The priest did not want to defile himself because if he touches a dead body, or as some people thought, which is totally wrong, if he touches blood, he becomes impure. And you're impure, you're not able to work in the temple. In Numbers 19, we're told it should be N-U-M, I apologize. We're told, he that touches a dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself within the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. This is talking about anybody. But if he purify not himself on the third day, on the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whoever touches the dead body of any man and pureth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord, and he shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled on him. He shall be unclean, his uncleanliness upon him. In Leviticus, we're told, so that's what happens. You encounter a dead body, you're impure for seven days. If you work in the temple for seven days, there goes your income. Leviticus 21 tells us, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, They shall not be defiled from the dead among his people. You're not allowed to be to become impure. Interesting enough, here is a, <laughs> this is a spectacular mikvah that was found in Bethany, really. But now, Walt Wink, modern, progressive American theologian, said the parable of the compassionate Samaritan, it's not the good Samaritan, which is a nice politically correct correction. If he came four cubits of a dead man, he would be defiled and was liable to <laughs> disciplinary flogging. And he quotes the Babylonian Talmud from Sota. In other words, he didn't want to come close because he would be defiled, and he would also be punished by flogging. Now, honestly, unfortunately, Walter Wink has passed away. That doesn't appear anywhere. It does say in the Babylonian Talmud, a corpse occupies four cubits with regard to impurity. In other words, in that area, the area around the person is also impure, as the sages decreed that once that one becomes impure when he stands within four cubits of a corpse. This measure protects priests and others who are forbidden to contract ritual impurity imparted by a corpse so that they do not inadvertently become impure. In other words, it's not really that you become impure, but by building a fence around the corpse in a way, it prevents you from contracting that. Here we see the, the priest's blessing in the temple. This is not a real picture because there were no cameras when the temple existed, but here's an attempt to depict it. There's some issues with that, but well, what is wrong about everything we just said? The story specifically tells us the priest coming down from Jerusalem. In other words, he is leaving Jerusalem. He finished his job. So the element if he becomes impure, he becomes impure. It will not affect his work. Like any other person, he will after seven days, he will be pure. So and the, when the text specifically tells us he is coming down from Jerusalem, there's no problem with him becoming impure. Blood of a person is not impure. So the, those who claim that not touching. Now, the Levite coming along disproves the concept of impurity as the rules that apply to Kohanim do not apply to the Levites. And the same impurity laws that apply to Jews apply also to Samaritans. So the bottom line was it, 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 that is the, the, the element of fearing to become impure just is not the right answer. And again, when going down, both the priest and the Levite, as the lawyer, are commanded to love thy neighbor. And as we learned last week, to love the stranger. They were obliged to assist the Samaritan. Now, is what the Jewish law tradition demands. The book of Tobit, by the Pickerful writing, second century BC, we're told in the days of Shalmaneser, I had performed many charitable deeds for my kindred, members of my people. I would give my bread to the hungry and clothing to the naked. If I saw one of my people who died and had been thrown behind the wall of Nineveh, which was in Iraq, I used to bury him. In other words, one of the most basic demands, you see somebody, and especially if the person is dead, you are obliged 
to bury them. You're obliged to, you're obliged to help them, but if the person is dead, you're obliged because it is forbidden to leave a body unburied. Philo, first century Jewish philosopher based in Alexandria says that no one shall keep anyone from performing the funeral honors to the dead, but shall even throw upon them so much earth as is sufficient to protect them from impiety, that no one shall violate or move in any manner or degree what, whatever the graves or tombs or memorials of those who are dead. In other words, if they thought the person was dead, they had a, an obligation the same, if not greater than hel actually helping them. And in the Mishnah, Nazir, we're told a high priest and a Nazarene may not now, may, may not, the Nazarene may not become ritually impure even to bury their deceased relatives. However, they become, they have to become impure to bury a corpse with no one to bury it. It's called the met mitzvah, somebody who doesn't have a place to be buried. You are obliged to, if one of them comes across a corpse of a Jew and there's nobody else to bury it, he must bury the body. And that's exactly what was described especially not knowing if he was dead. They were blind. If he was not dead, then there's no element of impurity involved. So the Jewish law clearly demands. For Luke, it is the Pharisees who are concerned about impurity. And if you look throughout Luke, and this has been very interesting research, he mocks the Pharisees for being over-concerned about purity much more than the priests. Example in Luke 11, and when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he was, had not washed before dinner, but woe, and then but a few verses down, but woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue all manners of herbs, herbs and pass judgment and the love of God, the out ye to have done and not to leave the others undone. You're putting your emphasis on purity and washing of mint and tithing mint, you, and there are many other examples within Luke. So Luke is not there to challenge the priest or the Levite on impurity. So why the Samaritan? Now, that didn't jump up by coincidence. When you would have told an, a Jew in those days and all the way till today, you would say, Kohen, priest, Levite, the immediate follow-up would be Israelite, the three levels, the priest, the Levite, the Israelite. And by saying priest, Levite, Samaritan, Professor Amy Jill Levine gave the best definition. She said, if anybody were to be told, Mo, Larry, of course they would know you have to follow up with Curly. But in reality, what this was, priest, Levite, Samaritan, it would be like saying Mo, Larry, Osama Bin Laden. She has a wonderful sense of humor. And that any Jew hearing Jesus giving that talk would say, wait a minute, where did that come from? That makes absolutely no sense. So what is the right, <coughs> to my highly subjective opinion, explanation of the story of the Good Samaritan? For that, we turn to somebody who lived just around 50 years ago. This was Martin Luther King's talk the day before he was assassinated. And he gives probably, to my opinion, the most accurate reading of the Good Samaritan. So here you have it. This is the one place I found the recording online. One day a man came to Jesus and he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters of life. At points, he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and throw him off base. Now, that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. And he talked about a certain man 
who fell among thieves. You remember that a Levite and the priest passed by on the other side. They didn't stop to help him. Finally, a man of another race came by. He got down from his beast, decided not to be compassionate by proxy. But he got down with him, administered first aid, and helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying this was the good man, this was the great man. Because he had the capacity to project the eye into the thou and to be concerned about his brother. Now you know we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. The times we say they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering, and they had to get on down to Jerusalem so they wouldn't be late for their meeting. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who was engaged in religious ceremonial was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. And every now and then we begin to wonder whether maybe they were not going down to Jerusalem, or down to Jericho rather, to organize a Jericho Route Road Improvement Association. That's a possibility. Maybe they felt that it was better to deal with the problem from the causal route rather than to get bogged down with an individual effect. But I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. That's right, that's right. I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as the setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 miles, or rather 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you are about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody pass. You know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking. He was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, love them there for quick and easy siege. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to my job? Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. So this is the one recording that I found of the talk, of speech. And to my opinion, Martin Luther King's reading was totally accurate. Jesus' message was very, very simple. It doesn't matter who you are, 
what you are, it's how you behave and how you view others. And Jesus saw the need to reach out to all and to teach his disciples and especially re-educate the lawyer what it is to love the other like thyself. You look at the other and through him you see yourself. So at that I will conclude.